So the first lesson is from the book of Exodus, chapter 2, verses uh, 11 through 25. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and saw their forced labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his kinsfolk. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, he saw two Hebrews fighting, and he said to the one who was in the wrong, why do you strike your fellow Hebrew? He answered, who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh. He settled in the land of Midian and sat down by a well. The priest of Midian had seven daughters. They came to draw water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. But sh some shepherds came and drove them away. Moses got up and came to their defense and watered their flock. When they returned to their father, Ruel, he said, how is it that you've come back so soon today? They said, an Egyptian helped us against the shepherds. He even drew water from us and for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, where is he? Why do you leave the man? Invite him back to break, break bread. Moses agreed to stay with the man and he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah in marriage. She bore a son and named him Gershom, for, she's, for he said, I have been an alien residing in a foreign land. After a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Out of the slavery, <laughs> their cry for help rose to God. God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites, and God took notice of them. The New Testament lesson is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, uh, chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, and which you also stand, which also you are being saved. If you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you, as of first importance, what I in turn received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And he has appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as one untimely born. He appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. Here ends the reading. So I believe I've, I've told this story before, but it goes particularly with the, the Old Testament lesson for this morning. When I was in seminary, we had chapel every day, and chapel, just like church, was followed by coffee hour. I remember one coffee hour, I was talking with my classmates, and after the standard discussion of which pot of coffee had the good coffee that morning, we started discussing the scripture lesson for the day, which was about Moses. And I distinctly remember one of my classmates sagely taking a bite of his munchkin and saying, I take great comfort that Moses was a murderer. We all turned and looked at him, and he said, continuing on through his munchkin, well, if Moses was a murderer, that certainly means there's hope for me with God. I haven't killed anyone, and Moses murdered a guy, but God had him be the one who led the Israelites out of slavery. Well, today we're looking at the part of Moses' life where he did murder a guy, and surprisingly, the lectionary doesn't include the murder part of Moses' story. Can't imagine why. And uh, <laughs> because this part of uh, Moses' story doesn't get read a lot in worship, many of us probably have an understanding of Moses' story from, like, films. 
Uh, the two movies I think of the most are uh, the classic uh, Ten Commandments, uh, because we watch that nearly every year on ABC. And then there's the 1998 animated classic, The Prince of Egypt, which is spectacular. It even has Patrick Stewart as the old pharaoh, and I always loved him from The Next Generation. But however spectacular both those movies are, they add a lot of plot points that aren't in the actual Bible. So we're going to look at some of those key differences. Now last week we covered how Pharaoh had issued an edict ordering all the Hebrew baby boys be drowned in the Nile. And his family hid Moses for some months, but his mother eventually places him in a basket on the river to hopefully send him to safety. And Moses is discovered and adopted by Pharaoh's daughter who raises him as her own. And this week we pick up the story once Moses is grown. Now, both those movies I mentioned, The Ten Commandments and The Prince of Egypt, they're structured where Moses has no idea of his Hebrew heritage, and there's a big reveal of Moses' true parentage that causes him an existential crisis. But the actual biblical text doesn't spell any of that out. And now, I'd, I'd actually argue there's a better case for Moses knowing his heritage right from the start. The text says Moses went out to his people and saw an Egyptian beating one of his kinsfolk. Now kinsfolk is a term that indicates Moses felt kinship with the Hebrews and identified with them. To me it reads like Moses has always known his ethnicity, but once he's grown he really starts to wrestle with his identity as a person raised in Pharaoh's household, but also who's a Hebrew. And struggling with and exploring identity is a fairly common feature of being a young adult. And it's also really common for people who are adopted. We all want to know where we belong and where we fit in. So Moses sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his kinsfolk, and Moses kills the Egyptian. Now in the Ten Commandments, Moses kills an Egyptian while rescuing Joshua from captivity and certain death. So it's like a brave rescue scene. And in the Prince of Egypt, the Egyptian's death is an accident. Moses tackles the Egyptian to stop him from beating the Hebrew, and the Egyptian falls from some scaffolding and to his death in front of many witnesses. However, the Bible quite clearly indicates Moses did not kill the Egyptian by accident or in a struggle. It says Moses looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So killing the Egyptian was 100% on purpose and premeditated, and he even tries to hide evidence of his crime. Now, killing someone to try to save someone else is in lots of systems of ethics and acceptable action. There's a whole school of Christian thought called just war theory that seeks to outline conditions when it's morally acceptable for Christians to go to war and kill other human beings. And self-defense and defending someone else are two key conditions for a war to be considered just. And if you're wondering, like, is there a modern example of a just war? Like, um, World War II, from the Allied perspective, is probably the one that checks every single box. However, other conditions for killing or for a war to be considered justified traditionally include efforts to uh, avoid the conflict or attempting steps to avoid a fatal options first. And the Bible also has a strong emphasis in the Old Testament on punishments being proportionate to the crime. So if someone pokes out your eye, the punishment for that assault is not death because that's dis disproportionate to the harm caused. Now I'm not saying Moses is a bad guy or that it's right to let someone be beaten in front of you. But I believe it's worth noting that Moses' actions are not the ones that we would expect of a paragon of virtue. His heart was certainly in the right place in trying to help someone who was helpless. But he murders someone trying to do that. Moses messes up. And we'll get back to that point in a bit. But first, we're going to continue on with uh, the rest of Moses' story today. So the day after killing the Egyptian, Moses goes out and intervenes in a fight between two Hebrews, and one of them gives Moses some lip, indicating that people know Moses murdered someone. And it turns out Pharaoh even learns what happened, and Moses flees into the wilderness, into the land of Midian, to avoid being executed for his crime. 
Now, while Moses is in Midian, he helps the daughters, the seven daughters of the priest of Midian, Jethro, uh, when there's a conflict at the well. And the daughters tell Jethro about Moses, this nice Egyptian man who helped them out. And Jethro tells his daughters to invite Moses over. And Moses must have continued to make a good impression because he ends up marrying one of Jethro's daughters, Zipporah, and then Moses begins his life and his new family in Midian. And after we get Moses settled into his new life, we get a couple verses foreshadowing things, uh, things to come in the situation in Egypt. Pharaoh dies, and God hears the cries of the Israelites trapped in their bondage. And God takes notice of their situation. And it's going to turn out that Moses will be a key player in God's solution for the Israelites. But at this point, Moses is unaware of his purpose. So there are a few lessons we can take away from looking at this part of Moses' life as a whole. Now, the first thing is that Moses seems to have a really strong sense of justice and wanting to help the underdog. He intervenes to stop the Hebrew slave from being beaten. He sticks up for the Hebrew that was done wrong by a fellow Hebrew. And Moses takes the side of the daughters at the well against the bullying shepherds. There's a phrase used in scripture to describe King David, that he was a man after God's own heart. And there's some debate about what precisely that means, but I believe we can apply it to Moses here. Moses is a man after God's own heart in that Moses' heart is troubled by the things that trouble God's heart. Moses, like God, has a deep concern for people who are mistreated by the powerful, for those who are downtrodden and on the margins of society. And having a heart for the people God is concerned about is one of the qualities we're meant to cultivate as Christians with the help of the Holy Spirit. Now, this part of Moses' story where he goes into the wilderness of Midian is also where Moses goes from being someone powerful to being someone on the margins of society. He goes from being the son of Pharaoh's daughter to being wanted for murder. This time in the wilderness helps form and equip Moses to eventually be the leader of his marginalized people. And an aspect of that is understanding what it's like to be at the mercy of others and to be on the outside looking in. This is time when Moses gets to experience solidarity with his fellow Hebrews through being an outcast like them. Now, one aspect of how Jesus redeems all of us is through God's demonstrated solidarity with our humanity through Jesus being born a human. In Christ, God experiences what it's like to be human, to be poor, to be on the margins of society. And it's through God being truly with us that we know God understands and is willing to go to death and back for us. And there are certain aspects of this with Moses. It's only through being an outsider that Moses is equipped with enough understanding to effectively help his people. So let's go back to the issue of Moses having murdered a guy. Now, knowing that Moses made such a huge mistake, yet was able to do so much good with the help of God is incredibly good news because it shows us what sort of God we have. Our God is a God of second chances. So looking at the New Testament lesson, it's from uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And this section overall is Paul explaining the importance of resurrection. And in particular, we read as Paul explains the significance of the resurrection through witnessing how God has been at work in his own life. And a key aspect of Paul's identity is he goes from being a Pharisee persecuting the church to preaching the good news of the gospel to anyone and everyone he can find because he had a transformative encounter with Jesus. And we get a sense of Paul's overwhelming feeling of gratefulness for God working in his life, even when Paul has done some truly awful things. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am and his grace toward me has not been in vain. Paul is testifying to the truth of the resurrection because he's experienced resurrection in his own life. God has turned his life around, plucked him out of wrongdoing, and given him a purpose. If God can work that sort of resurrection in Paul's own life, there's no telling what's possible with God. Resurrection and transformation are possible for all of us because God is a God of second chances. I'm going to hazard a guess that Moses and Paul have messed up bigger than any of us have. 
Moses murdered one guy. Paul's responsible for many people being killed. But God didn't give up on them. God found them, turned them around, gave them a purpose to work good in the world. And God doesn't give up on us when we fall short or run into difficulty. In scripture, we can see the good news that our God is in the savior business, that none of us are beyond being turned around, that the world isn't too broken to be put right. No matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter how much money you have, no matter who you love, no matter where you're from, no matter what you look like, no matter what you've done, the grace of God, the love of God, and the kingdom of God are for you. And by the grace of God, we are who we are, and we can trust that God's grace for us has not been in vain. Or as one of my co classmates said at coffee hour one day, well, if Moses was a murderer, that certainly means there's hope for me. Thanks be to God. Amen.